In today's class, we are going to examine the, con the consequences of European contacts both in Africa and in the New World. In order to do this, I was going to pose two of the following questions. First of all, how did the arrival of Europeans in the Americas transform native life and culture? And second, what were the factors that led to the success of the European conquest of the New World? The stage for the European conquest of the New World actually begins in Africa. Geographers of the ancient world, both write, writing both in Latin and in Greek, had accumulated substantial knowledge about northern Africa, but they're almost completely ignorant of anything south of the Saharan Desert. Medieval writers, incorporating and borrowing from uh, their ancient predecessors, were equally ill-informed, reported that sub-Saharan Africa was populated by man-eaters and Amazon women, warrior women who cut off one breast in, in order to facilitate archery. In reality, the interiors of, 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 of sub-Saharan Africa had been governed for centuries by highly developed kingdoms and boasted numerous wealthy cities. Uh, in fact, many of the cities would have, been, would, would have rivaled anything that Europe had produced uh, in terms of Paris or London. Um, in fact, many of these African cultures were highly sophisticated and highly developed. By the 15th century, for example, Muslim contacts with Sub-Saharan Africa made it clear that the region was a rich, uh, rich source for gold and slaves. And I think this is one of the things that becomes very important when we, understand, when we try to understand the slave trade particularly when we look at it in this 19th century con uh, con uh, context, which of course is slightly out of the context of this course. Um, but the fact is, is that slavery has been, a, African slavery has had a long, long history in which the Europeans tap into. Uh, Europeans don't create a slave trade. Sadly, they end up perfecting something that is that was already there. But in search of these, uh, gold, slaves, and other resources, Europeans, especially the Portuguese, and again, I think we have to bear in mind, um, while we often ignore Portugal as sort of on the periphery of, uh, of early modern Europe uh, in favor of uh, France, England, even Spain, and Germany. Uh, it's Portugal that, spent, that really opens up uh, the idea of not just um, African trade, but also new world exploration as well, um, as we'll see later uh, as we go through this, through this lecture. The Portuguese in particular were well situated. Uh, they, of course, are on the seaboard. They are sea, which led to seafaring people. Um, but more importantly, the Portuguese also were responsible for some of the most important developments in shipmaking and shipbuilding um, since Roman times, um, which allowed Europeans for the first time since the Vikings to, allow, to, um, to go on long distant voyages. Um, European settlers founded colonies in the Atlantic islands off the west coast of Africa, which essentially set the precedent for other colonies. Um, even the plantation system in, in the southern United States, the Caribbean, uh, Brazil, are largely based on the template provided by the Portuguese um, in areas like the Canary Islands and the Azores Islands. And essentially, um, it is this, the, these islands, the Azores, the Canary Islands, uh, which of course are now very popular des vacation destinations, uh, which, which acted as the launching pad for further Portuguese uh, incursions along the African coast, where they set up trade, uh, trading posts and forts to facilitate the trade of both gold and slaves. Although Sub-Saharan Africa represented something of a mystery to Europeans, merchants in Italy, Catalonia, Castile, and Portugal had long shown interest in the ports of the Maghreb, a collectively, the collective name of Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia. There they bought wool and woolen textiles, wine, uh, dye stuffs, and clandestine items like weapons. In the 13th and 14th century, Europeans traveled their, uh, tra traded their silver for African gold, which was then resold for more silver, which led to the development of gold coinage. Uh, again, this is one of the things that comes out of European contacts with Africa, is an increasing supply of coin and currency, which helped um, end the barter system. To gain more access to the sources of gold, European traders occasionally cross the Sahara with ca uh, camel caravans. The efficient camel caravans created a, a vast trading network that stretched from Mali and Morocco in the west of Africa into Central Asia, completely bypassing the Mediterranean. But Europeans had little hope of regularly, regularly using these land routes across North Africa because of the, of the hostility of the Muslims who were wary of Christian interlopers. The disadvantages of Mediterranean galleys were uh, surmounted during the 15th century through changes in the technology of ocean sailing. The Iberian Peninsula, situated between the Mediterranean and the Atlantic, was uniquely located to develop a hybrid ship that combined features of Mediterranean and Atlantic types. The initial impulse for developing the shipping technology 
was to facilitate trade between the Mediterranean and North Europe, uh, Northern Europe via the Atlantic. The resulting changes, however, also made possible much more ambitious voyages into unknown southern regions. The Iberians modified the cog design, the dominant ship in the Atlantic, by adding extra masts and creating a new kind of rigging that combined the square sails of Atlantic ships, suitable for sailing in the same direction as the wind as, as the wind was blowing. The triangular lanting sails of, Medi of Mediterranean galleys, which permitted sailing into the wind, uh, which, landed, which led to the result of a ship that could sail in the variety of winds, carry large loads, and be managed by a small crew and defended by guns mounted in the ca uh, castle superstructure. These hybrid three-mast ships, called caravels, appeared about 1450 and about for the next 200 years pretty much dominated the oceans. Also assisting European navigators were other technological innovations. The compass provided an approximate indicator of direction, and the astrolobe and naked eye celestial navigation made it possible to establish latitude. Books of sailing directions called port uh, portolanos included charts and descriptions of ports and recorded the location of dangerous shoals and safe harbors for future voyages. The, advantage the advances in maritime technology made it possible for, European, uh, for Europeans motivated by economic, economic need and religious fervor to sail wherever they wanted. During the 15th century, European colonization departed somewhat from the patterns of the past. Medieval colonies established during the Crusades of the 12th and 13th centuries had relied on native inhabitants pr to produce commodities that could be expropriated by the colonizers. These were either aristocratic colonies in which a few warriors occupied castles to dominate the native population, or mercantile colonies built around a trading post for foreign merchants. As Europeans ventured into the Atlantic more frequently and expanded their contacts with Sub-Saharan Africa, they established new patterns of colonization. In search of fertile lands for agriculture, Castile and Portugal founded colonies in the Canary Islands, the Madeira Archipelago, the Azores, and the Cape Verde Islands. The first new type of colony of, during this period was the settler colony. The settler colony derived from the med medieval feudal model of government, in which a private person obtained a license from the king to seize an island or some part of an island. The king supplied financial support and legal authority, this idea of Spanish, the need that for Spanish uh, conquistadors uh, and nobles to rely on legal authority will become very important when we look at the example of the New World. In return, the seller promised to recognize the king as his lord and occasionally to pay a fee after the settlement was successful. The second type was the plantation colony. Until the occupation of the Cape Verde Islands in the 1460s, the Atlantic island colonies had relied on European settlers for labor. However, the Cape Verde, Cape Verde Islands attracted few immigrants because of the rigors of the tropical climate, yet they were perfect for, for sugarcane crops. To solve this problem, Europeans went to the African coast to buy slaves. And again, the point I made at the, the top of this lecture, Europeans didn't, didn't begin the slave trade, but they were using an already market. In the Cape Verde Islands, we see the tragic conjunction, however, between African slaves and Europeans, the, Europeans' demand for sugar. The first European voyages along the African coast during the 15th century were launched by the Portuguese. The sponsor of these voyages was Henry the Navigator, who lived between 1394 and 1460. The first Portuguese expeditions along the African coast were prompted by Henry's desire to capture the Canaries and to find new sources of gold. This desire caused the sailors to move further south down the African coast. The Portuguese did not establish settler or plantation colonies, but rather set up trading posts that supplied gold, ivory, pepper, and slaves. Once a template had been set along the coast of Africa, it wasn't long before Spanish adventurers began to sail further uh, west as well. Um, most of these adventurers were the conquistadors who, thems who themselves came from impoverished minor noble families. The conquistadors sought fortune and royal recognition through explorations and conquests of, of indigenous peoples. Spain was a poor land with few opportunities for advancement, a bleak situation that made the lands of the New World a powerful lure to many seeking a fortune. Many of the conquistadors launched their own expeditions with little or no legal authority, hoping to acquire sufficient riches to impress the king to give them official sanction for additional conquests. Those who did acquire legal authority from the crown received the privilege to conquer new lands in the name of the king of, uh, of Spain and to keep a portion of those territories for themselves. In return, they were obliged to turn over to the king one-fifth 
known as the Royal Fifth, of everything of value they acquired. This was enforced by a notary who was always on hand to record the valuables. All the conquistadors were required was to re read a document called the, uh, re the Requirement or the Requerimento to the natives before making war on them. The document briefly explained the principles of Christianity and commanded the nat natives to accept them immediately, along with the authority of the Pope and the King of Spain. If the natives refused, they were warned that they would be forced through, uh, through war to subject themselves to the yoke and obedience of the Church and of their Highnesses, or else. The Requerimento revealed conflicting motives behind the Spanish conquest. On one hand, the Spanish were sincerely interested in converting the natives to Christianity. On the other, the conquistadors were trying to let themselves off the hook over the immorality of their actions by suggesting that the natives had brought the attack upon themselves by refusing to obey the Spanish king. The lunacy of the Requerimento um, was ca is captured brilliantly by the Spanish theologian and uh, bishop, uh, Bartolome de las Castas, who wrote one of the most scathing reports of Spanish actions in the New World, uh, his short account of the destruction of the Indies. Uh, in it, of course, he takes he, it uh, catalogs all the various atrocities committed by Spanish conquistadors uh, to our, our New World natives. Uh, the book itself is uh, a fantastic little book of harrowing reading. Um, certainly, it was enough to create uh, what became known as the Black Legend of Spain, the Black Spanish Legend, um, in which Spain's atrocities um, very much were used by England, particularly England and France, um, to to discredit Spanish um, efforts in the New World. Um, but more importantly, uh, Las Casas is, of course, aware of, of the requirements of and this need to read out um, this complicated legal document in which uh, Spanish conquistadors claim, uh, lay claim to native land and the natives didn't uh, acquiesce in this um, essentially land grab, uh, they would be killed. Um, Los Casas noted the fact that how do you expect a native population who does not speak Spanish to understand a conquistador who only speaks Spanish? Um, and in lamenting and lambasting the Spanish, this, this sort of Spanish hypocrisy uh, that is so evident in the Requerimento, uh, Las Casas, in, in one of the most poignant lines, I think, in New World literature, at least European um, contact literature, um, whenever you thought about the Requerimento, whenever you thought of this requirement, Las Casas always said, I never knew whether to laugh or to cry. Among the first and most successful of the conquistadors was Herman Cartes, who lived from 1485 to 1547. Cortes arrived on the Yucatan Peninsula in February 1519, beginning a conquest that culminated in the collapse of the Aztec Empire and the Spanish colonization of Mexico. He followed a policy of divide and conquer with the natives, making alliances with people who hated the Aztecs and then using their warriors in the front lines of his battle where they absorbed most of the, most lo uh, the most losses. If after a reading of the requirimento, the natives re native chieftains did not immediately surrender, Cor Cortes's men attacked them, breaking through their, li uh, their lines on horses, which the natives had never before seen. After a number of bloody battles, Cortes set off with 450 Spanish troops, 15 horses, and 4,000 natives to conquer the great capital of the Aztec Empire, Tenochtitlan, uh, which of course today is modern-day Mexico City. Uh, the city at the time of Cortes in the 16th century had about 300,000 inhabitants and defended by thousands of warriors. And this is where we, I think, get a sense of some of the European mythology behind the, the New World Conquest. After all, uh, Montezuma, the, the, the Aztec emperor, had his command thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of warriors, and Cortes had essentially what seemed to be a motley army. However, there are a lot of questions that go on in order to, in order to explain the, what seems to be an inexplicable loss of the Aztecs. Because as Cortes approached, Montezuma II was slow to put up a defense because of his belief that Cortes was a white god Quetzalcoatl, and who was supposed to return from the east. Um, the idea that Cortes was a returning god had paralyzed, in part, Montezuma's ability to take any decisive action with tragic consequences. Thus, what we see is instead of an ardent military campaign, the king's defense primarily took the form of ritual sacrifices, which of course failed. Cortes, after after not too long a battle, captured Montezuma. Uh, Montezuma ruled, he lived, uh, Cortes kept him alive, and Montezuma ruled for a few months as a Spanish puppet. However, as Spanish atrocities and abuses continued, the city revolted and drove the Spanish out during what was known as the Noche Triste, 
or the sad night. Cortes, who was out of, of, uh, of Tenochtitlan at the time, was able to rally and besiege the city. By the time the city surrendered, the shining jewel that had so impressed the Spanish when they first glimpsed it from the surrounding mountains lay in smoldering ruins. By 1522, Cortes controlled a territory in New Spain, larger than that of Old Spain. Aztec culture and religion of human sacrifice disappeared as the Franciscan friars arrived to evangelize the surviving population. Like other conquistadors, Francesco Prezero, who lived from 1478 to 1541, was poor, but he bore the additional social liabilities of, of being illegitimate and being illiterate. With no prospects at home, Prezero found his way to Panama, where he accompanied Vaco, uh, Vaco Nunes de Balboa on an expedition in 1513 across the pa uh, Isthmus of Panama, during which Europeans got their first look at the Pacific Ocean. In 1531, Pizarro left Panama with a small expedition of 180 men and, three, and 30 horses. His goal was to conquer Peru, a land uh, known to be a land rich in gold. He gathered additional recruits along the way and sailed to northern Peru and sent out spies who discovered that the, Inc uh, Incan Emp Emp the Incan emperor, Aralupa, could be found in the highland city of uh, Caramarca. When Pizarro and his forces arrived there, the central square was empty, but Aralupa was encamped nearby with a large army. Bezero tre uh, treacherously invited Atalupa to come out for a parley, but instead took him captive. The news of the captive plunged the overly centralized uh, Incan Empire into a crisis because no one dared take action without the emperor's orders. In an attempt to satisfy the Spanish hunger for gold and to win its freedom, Atalupa had a room filled with gold and silver for the conquistadors. Uh, but as you can imagine, the treasure merely stimulated their appetite for more. In, which led in July 1533, Bezero executing Atalupa, and by the following November, capturing the demoralized capital, uh, capital of Cusco. The conquest of Peru vastly increased the size of the Spanish Empire, and began to satisfy the craving for gold that Im impelled Columbus and the conquistadors in the first place. The discovery in 1545 of the silver mines of Potosi, along with better refining processes, increased the amount of silver that was being sent to Spain. I think one of the questions that we need to answer, um, and I think it's a really interesting one, is how did the Spanish conquer these vast empires? After all, when we look at the numbers, Cortes only had a few hundred Spanish soldiers with him, um, and Pizarro had even less. So how was it that Cortes was able to conquer the Aztec Empire, this, in a sense, one of the major, world, uh, major power in its day, um, and how did Pizarro do the same thing in Peru? Well, I think this, is one of the things that we have in terms of European myths, the notion that somehow Cortes heroically, with only a few guns, a few horses, and uh, against all the odds, was able to take down the powerful empire of, of um, the Aztecs. In a way, it would be the equivalent of watching, um, or perhaps assuming that somehow an African tribe would take down the Holy Roman Empire. Um, it's that type of scale. I think one of the things we need to understand is Cortes was a brilliant tactician. Um, what he was able to do was to win over other native peoples. The Aztecs, like any other empire, um, was based on expansion, but not just in terms of territorial expansion, which of course the Aztecs were very keen on, but the fact is the Aztecs demanded human sacrifice. Um, and when we talk about human sacrifice, we are talking about thousands of people. Um, the Aztecs would often engage in ritualized and ceremonial warfare, simply to take captives that could be sacrificed um, on the altars. Uh, you can imagine, of course, that the subject peoples found this incredibly problematic and were incredibly hostile to it. The conquistadors offered an opportunity um, for the subjects, uh, subject peoples and the Aztecs. The idea is that the Spanish can't be any worse than the Aztecs themselves. And to some degree, that, of course, may be the case. After all, the Spanish never demanded human sacrifice of their peoples. Um, however, I'm sure that many of those subject peoples uh, lived to regret that decision. So when you look at the, con uh, the Spanish conquest of, of Tenochtitlan and the Aztec Empire, I think one of the things that we need to bear in mind is the Spanish had an awful lot of help. Um, it also goes, and particularly when we look at Atalupa in the uh, Peruvian example, it's also important to understand sort of generally the political setup of the Aztecs and the Incas. Highly centralized, highly top-down um, organizations. And so in, uh, with Montezuma, 
uh, with the Aztecs and with uh, Atalupa, with the Incas. No one could really do anything without commands from the top. Um, Pizarro and Cortez were smart enough to know that, or to recognize that uh, as a cultural trait and a cultural distinction, this is really, impo <clears throat> really important in trying to win or trying to defeat uh, their, their much more numerous opponents. Um, particularly with the Incas, the emperor commanded, made every command. And when he was gone, when he'd been captured by Pizarro, there quite literally was no one to offer orders. Um, the Europeans, in a sense, had the advantage, um, used to more decentralized authority, um, more likely to um, take the initiative. The Aztecs and Incas were unable to, nego uh, to ad um, adapt and to adopt to changing tactics. Uh, also, of course, we see in a lot of the certain Aztec battles, um, ritualized warfare, but the Aztecs were particularly good at ritualized warfare. Um, and so they come in with ceremonial armor that had um, bright colored feathers, um, ceremonial armor, which made them targets for Spanish uh, weaponry, um, which of course also helped uh, eliminate most of any resistance that the Spanish um, would face both in, in modern day Mexico and in Peru. The basic form of economic and social organization in Spanish America was the encomienda system, which was created as an instrument to exploit native labor. An encomienda was a royal grant awarded for military or other services that gave the conquistador and the successors the right to gather tribute from the Indians in a defined area. In return, the encomiendero was the theoretically obliged to protect the natives and teach them the rudiments of the Christian faith. Because the encomiendas were large, only a small number of Spanish settlers were actually encomiendos. In Greater Peru, which includes modern-day Peru, Ecuador, and Bolivia, there were never more than 500 encomienderos. By the 17th century, the encomenderas had evolved to become great landed states called haciendas. The King of Spain was represented by two viceroys, who were the highest colonial authority, one in Mexico City and the other in Lima, Peru. In Spanish America, the church was a more, was a more effective presence than the state. As heirs to the long Christian struggle against Islam, and in particular, the reconquest of the Iberian Peninsula from the Muslims, the missionaries found in the Americas an exceptional opportunity to expand Christianity. The most zealous missionaries were members of the religious orders, the Franciscans, Dominicans, and Jesuits, who were dis distinguished from the parish priests by their autonomy and special training for missionary work. We can question, though, however, just how Christianized New World actually became. Um, and for those who are familiar with things like the Day of the Dead, um, what we see, of course, is a melding of uh, Aztec native religions along with Christianity. Um, however, there is no question that uh, the religious orders spent a lot of time and in many ways were successful in Christianizing the New World. Before Columbus set sail, set sail to the West, Europeans possessed two systems of thought that seemed to explain everything, um, both Ar Aristotle and Christian. The ancient Greek philosopher and his followers provided a systematic explanation of geography and cosmology based on what they knew about the world. They had named the continents, described their peoples, and established the size of the globe. Particularly in the European universities, Aristotle was still considered the primary source of all human knowledge. But even Aristotle had not imagined the Americas, and that fact raised the possibility that he was wrong in other matters as well. Great civilization in the tropics, where Aristotle said that no one could live there for the heat. In other words, there is a crisis of, of um, intellectual authority. The other authority, of course, was the Bible. For Christians and Jews, the Bible remained the unchallenged authority on the origins of the whole world. But the New World created numerous problems for biblical interpretation. Genesis told of the creation in the Great Flood, which had destroyed all people and all animals, except those saved in Noah's Ark. The New World brought into question that vision of a single creation and cleansing flood simply because it could not explain why the plants and animals of the Americas were so different. The greatest conceptual challenge to Christian Europe were the New World peoples themselves. If these people were not the children of God, then how did they get there? And if they were God's children, then why were they so different from Europeans? In the terms available to 16th century thinkers, there were only three possible ways to answer these questions. One. They are subhuman, demons, or some strange form of animal life. This idea was useful to those wanting to exploit the natives, who believed them to be devil worshippers, incestuous, and cannibalistic. 
and that they did not possess a human soul, who could not be, therefore could not be converted or civilized, and therefore, even more damaging, they were natural slaves. Second, they were innocents, living in an earthly paradise, unspoiled by European society. The most influential spokesman for the innocence of the natives was Bartolome de las Castas, the Bishop of Chiapas in Mexico. He originally owned a comienda until a sermon by Antonio Montesinos transformed his life and Las Casas became a defender of the natives. Engaged in a debate with the Spanish theologian Sepulveda about the justification of enslaving the natives, he wrote a book, as I was mentioned a little bit earlier, A Short Account of the Destruction of the Indies, uh, which was published in 1542. Through his influence, royal policy softened. Um, granted, it still did not see the natives as equals, just innocent who needed the help of European culture, and in particular, European religion. Las Casas, um, his defense of the natives is somewhat tempered by the fact that he also supported African slavery. Although near his death, he regretted this once, uh, regretted this uh, once he recognized the scale of, of the uh, African slave problem. And finally, the third answer to the question of to who were the world, New World natives is that you have people who recognize their differences as a natural consequence of human diversity. Advocates proposed a form of cultural toleration. The inconvenient facts of the New World put into doubt the traditional moral standards for judging the behavior of other peoples. This led to the beginning of cultural relativism. Uh, many of these ethnographers recognize that, the, that many standards of justice are specific to particular cultures rather than fixed truths established by natural or divine law. One of the biggest supporters of this idea was the French philosopher Michel de Montaigne, uh, who, uh, the French essayist, who wrote an essay entitled On Cannibals, which he pointed out the hypocrisy of condemning New World cannibals when Christians were torturing and slaughtering each other in France over obscure theological questions. How many have died over the word hawk, Montan asked. Montan also argued that a truly ethic, uh, eth um, ethical and truly Christian person was not a rich follower of biblical laws, but was capable of understanding and tolerating cultural differences. The discovery in the New World that non-Christians could lead moral lives, love their families, practice humility and charity, and benefit from highly developed religious institutions shook the complacent sense of European uh, superiority. As the discovery of this new world and the undermining of the sense of European superiority in the established order, which provides much of the uh, intellectual groundwork which will lead to things like the scientific revolution and the Enlightenment.